Hi, I'm Susan Euler. If you've never taken an art history course, or perhaps even if you have, you may not recognize all the references to artworks that you come across. For example, you have probably seen someone with a tattoo that looks like this, but did not know that the design is taken directly from a work of art, the Book of Kells. In fact, many of the fonts and distinctive interlaced designs that we tend to think of as generically Irish are also taken directly, or at least inspired by, the Book of Kells. But why the Book of Kells specifically? Good question. There are other early medieval manuscripts. And why is Edvard Munch's The Scream reproduced so often? Is it the best work he ever painted? Far from it. Munch created over a thousand paintings during his long career, a good many of them, in my opinion, better artistically and technically than The Scream. And the same is true for Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, Grant Wood's American Gothic, and yes, even the burial mask of King Tut. These artworks are good, and they deserve to be recognized as such. But millions of good artworks exist. Why have these in particular been reproduced, parodied, revered, and copied over and over until they have become cliches? Let's look at some possible answers. First, familiarity. Anything that is heard, seen, are talked about often enough becomes fixed in the public's mind, as rock stars and politicians well know. However, this fame is usually short-lived and tends to be generational. Really? Who is Gina Lola Brigida? But Marilyn Monroe? Yeah, I've heard of her. There's that poster you see everywhere. Aha! Now, as a teacher, I often ask students to name an artwork or an artist. They used to name Rembrandt, but not so much anymore. His star seems to have faded. Leonardo da Vinci, however, is often named, along with the Mona Lisa. As for Edvard Munch, while the scream is sometimes given as an example of an artwork, I can't remember anyone naming Edvard Munch as an artist, at least not in the United States. In Norway, it's probably different, since Munch is Norway's leading artist. But moving on, artist names are sometimes known, but not their artworks, and vice versa. Here's how it works. Back in the day when people smoked a lot of cigars, there was a well-known brand called Dutch Masters, which still exists. The so-called Dutch Masters on the label is a painting by Rembrandt. Its real title is the Syndics of the Drapers Guild. Since it was common to use cigar boxes to store things, in the 1950s when this ad was made, most Americans could recognize at least one artwork, the Dutch Masters. Familiarity. But besides familiarity, are there other reasons why some artworks are more widely known than others that are just as good? Well, yes. For one, if they have an interesting backstory. That makes them exciting and mysterious. And who doesn't love a good mystery? Here's what you've been waiting for. The Burial Mask of King Tut. Tutankhamun was a little-known Egyptian pharaoh until archaeologist Howard Carter discovered his intact tomb in 1922. It caused an international sensation, making front page news. And even people who never read a newspaper knew all about King Tut, because like the Dutch masters, his name and image began appearing on all sorts of products, a trend that continues today. You probably already know about the alleged curse. So even if you saw the King Tut Immersive show, here are some things about the burial mask that you may not know. Although the mask is made of solid gold and very impressive, the workmanship is not what you would expect for an Egyptian royal. Note the crude and perfect joint. Archaeologist Nicholas Reeves suggests that this may indicate that the face section replaced an earlier one and that the mask had originally belonged to someone else. Reeves suggests it may have been Nefertiti, although this has not been proven. Nefertiti was the great royal wife of King Tut's father, Akhenaten. Since her tomb has never been found, this only adds to the mystery. Nonetheless, when King Tut's inner coffin was first opened, it did show signs of rough handling, or perhaps of an ancient mishap that dislodged the inlays of the vulture's eyes, which have never been found, and caused damage to one corner of the headdress. The ceremonial beard was also not properly attached and fell off when the mask was removed from the mummy. Now all this sounds very nefarious, and it may have been. However, 
Since part of the funeral ceremony required priests to lift and stand up the heavy mummy case, accidents probably occurred, requiring hasty and perhaps shoddy repairs. But we have no basis for comparison. Although there are many royal mummies, only three other pharaohs have been found with their burial masks intact. For all we know, there might have been lots of missing inlays and poor last-minute repairs. Speculation like this only increases the public's endless fascination with all things relating to King Tut. So what about the Book of Kells? The Book of Kells is a Christian gospel book that has been famous in religious circles ever since the Middle Ages. As previously discussed, once you know what to look for, references to the Book of Kells are everywhere. Created around 800 AD in either an Irish or a Scottish monastery, it contains the writings, or Gospels, of the four Christian evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Considered the finest example of manuscript illumination and calligraphy done in the insular style, also called the Irish, Scottish, Saxon style, it has a very colorful backstory. It somehow survived being pillaged by Viking raiders only to be wickedly stolen that's a contemporary quote, in 1007 to steal its lavishly jeweled cover and shrine. The shrine and cover were never recovered. The book itself was found discarded in a peat bog. In addition to its colorful backstory, the Book of Kells also appeals to us on a very human level. With playful illustrations of everyday life, a cat cleaning its fur, dogs, and lots of human beings, it speaks to our shared humanity. These blonde-haired, blue-eyed men Certainly the monks themselves who created the paintings look just like people living today a thousand years later. There is something very compelling about knowing that the people of the past looked just like us and enjoyed the same things that we still enjoy. All that separates us from them is time. Our essential humanity remains the same. Someone should make a movie out of this. And someone has. The Secret of Kells. I highly recommend it. Which brings us to the Mona Lisa, the Scream, and American Gothic. We can identify with these people as well, which is one of the reasons why they're so popular. Mona Lisa is Lisa del Giacondo, a wealthy Florentine noblewoman. But Leonardo depicts her as an ordinary person wearing unpretentious clothes. Compare this with the typical Renaissance portrait of a woman richly dressed in expensive fabrics and jewels that emphasize her wealth and importance. In real life, Lisa del Giacondo probably dressed like this as well. Ultra-high resolution scans have shown that she was originally painted with an elaborate pearl-encrusted veil. But Leonardo painted it out and gave her that mysterious smile. Why? We don't know. But despite what you may have heard, it was not because this is a self-portrait of Leonardo dressed as a woman. The Mona Lisa was a well-known painting during his lifetime. Someone would have mentioned it. But there are other genuine mysteries as well. For example, Leonardo may have made two slightly different versions, keeping this one for himself. This sketch by Raphael, his contemporary, shows the Mona Lisa flanked by two tall columns, which our version never had. Maybe a second version will be found that corresponds to the one Raphael drew. In any event, the Mona Lisa was not a world-famous painting before 1911, when it was stolen from the Louvre for political reasons. The resulting front page coverage brought it to the public's attention and made it into the icon it is today. As for Monks the Scream, this is a self-portrait, but not of his face, of his feelings, although the physical resemblance to the artist is unmistakable. Munch made four paintings as well as prints and drawings of the same subject during the early years of his career, when he was overwhelmed by mounting family, health, relationship, and career pressures. I felt a great infinite cry ringing through nature, is how he explained it. Well, we've all been there. We can all identify with this. At times, we are all Edvard Munch. American Gothic was painted in 1930 by Iowa artist Grant Wood, just when the United States was feeling the first effects of the Great Depression, and abstract art was considered foreign and threatening. An example of the style known as regionalism, American Gothic is often described as a celebration of the American pioneer spirit, hard work rewarded, stoicism in the face of adversity, an unpretentious lifestyle, and realistic art. It was not meta-satire. 
or so Grant Wood claimed. I, for one, do not believe him. Wood was well known for his satirical paintings. For example, this one entitled Daughters of Revolution depicts three self-satisfied ladies posed in front of a reproduction of Washington crossing the Delaware. They are members of the DAR, an exclusive club for women who can trace their family back to an American patriot. Like American Gothic, it's not a vicious satire, and also like American Gothic, it rings true. Whether we approve of it or not, they both capture aspects of the American character. So while regionalism, Grant Wood, and even the once powerful concept of the American pioneer spirit have all but faded from memory, the painting American Gothic lives on. A tribute to the power art has to connect us with the past and with our shared humanity. For the 10-Minute Professor, this is Dr. Susan Ray Euler. Thanks for tuning in.